Gracious Heavenly Father, I just come in your presence once again, just thankful for the opportunity you've given us to study your word together. I just ask that you would filter out all of the error, all the foolishness, but seal to our hearts that which is truth. For it's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. Hi, this is Steve at BlessedHopeForever.com. We've been going through Colossians verse by verse. And I've decided that what I'd like to do is give you an overview of this book before we wrap up the final chapter. Colossians, I believe, is, as, as I've said, when we began this study, a commentary on the book of Romans, and probably the most precise, the most succinct statement of biblical doctrine in all of the New Testament. So I'd like to go rapidly through this little uh, epistle, highlighting what I believe its message to us is. When we begin looking at chapter 4, it's entirely possible that we've forgotten chapter 1. And I also thought that a, a review was in order given the, the breakaway f uh, for Christmas. First of all, folks, the epistle was written to us. God's Word wasn't written to everyone, and, and contrary to popular opinion today, it, it's not a message from God to every human being. This epistle was written to us, and it was written to us in the spirit of thanksgiving. In fact, thanksgiving is an inseparable part of not only this epistle, but of our Christian experience. When we depart from thanksgiving, we depart from the realization that our God is God, that He's in control, that He works all things together after the counsel of His own will. And we actually see that there is thanksgiving in chapter 1, verse 3, chapter 1, verse 17, chapter 2, verse 7, and chapter 3, verses 15 and 17, and chapter 4, verse 2. It's a lot of thanksgiving. It ought to characterize our walk with God, folks. The, and the hope of, of heaven is highlighted in this epistle. That's a guarantee. That's not wishful thinking hope. That's a guaranteed expectation. This truth and this hope is to us and it's for us. It's a, it's a comforting thought to realize how important that we are to God. We are the central theme of God's interest, God's program, and God's purpose. He's not so busy that He doesn't have time for you. You are the primary focus of His attention. And I think that's wonderful. It is for us so that we might have a full knowledge of His will. You know, in the, in the, in the most common of things, a book, I have the truth of God and I have the opportunity to know His will. We can know His will. God is interested that we know His will. And the purpose being that we walk pleasing to Him. We don't want to do things that displease Him. Not because we're afraid of judgment. We're afraid of, of Him taking us to the woodshed. Uh, you know, afraid of retribution. But because we know that there won't be any. Loving the Lord is accompanied with an intense desire to know what the Lord wants. Our walk is centered in the person of His Son, not, not what we have to do, must do, or not do to, to be children of God, to be sons of God, or, or so that He won't be angry with us, but centered in the person and the work of Christ, who is the image of the invisible God, creator of heaven and earth, God of very God, the one who hung the stars in the sky, in fact, he not only made everything, he made everything for himself. The other day, driving along in my Jeep, I turned on the radio, and somebody called in uh, the question, 
you know, if Adam and Eve had not sinned, would somebody else have sinned? And, and the answer given by the guy on the radio was that, you know, yeah, probably, probably so, somebody else would have. And if nobody else did until he came along, that he would have. You know, I guess forgetting the fact that Adam was a perfect representation of the human race. Folks, Adam sinned because God put him in the Garden of Eden to sin. What if God willing to show his wrath against sin? The entire purpose was to set up a demonstration that, that no will but God's will will work. The Lord Jesus Christ created all things. He not only created them, he created them for himself. And God created peace between us and God. How did he do that? He did that through the cross and, and the death of Jesus Christ. It's amazing that the Lord Jesus Christ died in order that there might be peace between God and us and us and God. And most people that, well, at least most people that I meet don't feel they have any peace. There I am at peace with God and God's at peace with me. Because of what? Because of the death of Christ. I was reconciled to Him, and though I was alienated from God and I was His enemy, it was, it was when I was His enemy that He presented me holy, unblameable, and unreprovable in His sight. When? When He died. When He died in my place. The marvelous statement of this epistle, folks, is not that... I, I could be holy and unblameable and unreprovable if I strived to be, if I worked at it, if I cared to be, if I wanted to be. The statement is one of absolute fact because Jesus Christ died and rose again, not because I did anything, not because I accepted, not because I believed, not because I, I deserved it, not because I repented, not because I changed my manner of life, but because Jesus Christ died in my, in my place, folks. Everybody, to, everybody that you know of just about today wants to say that, that if we believe, receive, repent, accept, we, we do all this stuff, then God does that. That's not what the text says. Sorry to burst your bubble. That's not what the text says. This was accomplished when He died in our place. And not only is this a present reality, it is a guaranteed result. That's what we've learned as we've studied through this epistle. This epistle excites me, folks. In the 21st verse, if you continue in the faith grounded and settled and be not moved away from the hope of the gospel which you've heard and all of a sudden no, I'm supposed to be I'm supposed to be scared. You know, they read that Christians read that, and 85, 90% of, of Christianity jumps up and says, what you just said is not true because you got to continue in the faith. When the text says, but now are you reconciled in the body of his death that he might present you holy, unblameable, and unreprovable if you continue in the faith? What if you don't continue in the faith? Well, if you don't continue in the faith, folks, then you are not now reconciled. That's what the text is saying. The language couldn't be clearer. If you do not continue in the faith, it's because you're not reconciled. But if Jesus Christ did in fact die in your place, well, you now have the statement of God Almighty that you will continue in the faith. You, couldn't, you can't do anything else, folks, with the language. Well, if I don't continue in the faith, my reconciliation won't continue. It doesn't say that. It says that if you are now reconciled, you will continue in the faith. The reality of my present reconciliation is my continuance in the faith. Therefore, my continuance in the faith is based entirely upon my reconciliation, and that is based entirely upon the work of Jesus Christ. You know, one of the, the strongest verses in, in all the Bible that is absolutely contrary to the modern teaching, to the teaching of Arminians, and yet it's used by almost every Arminian to suggest that you can lose your reconciliation. 
when it's, cl it's clearly stating just the opposite of that. Our reconciliation is not only a present reality, it carries with it a guaranteed result. And God calls upon us to proclaim this truth, to tell others, to, to stand up and proclaim that truth, to pro proclaim Christ in you the hope of glory, something that you could not know unless you were told this mystery, to proclaim this mystery, which is Christ in you. The mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. The text is saying that you couldn't possibly know this unless God told you. No, no detective work, no chemical analysis, no, no Google search, no nothing. Okay? Unless He tells you. No way that you could know it unless God told you first. That's what, that's what it means by mystery. We proclaim this truth. And it's Christ whom we preach. We don't preach stuff. We don't preach things. We don't preach service, human responsibility. We preach grace so that men might be responsible. We preach grace so that men might be taught and admonished in the proper way. Sin shall not have dominion over us, for we're not under law, but we're under grace. Chapter 2, what are they taught? They're taught that God is interested in them. You know, we're taught that God's great concern is that we might know comfort. It is, it's my personal opinion. I'm persuaded that 90% of the Christians I meet don't know comfort. And they don't have comfort. God exhorts us over and over again to, to know that that He would have us be comforted. Folks, stop and let that think in, sink in. Let that sink in for a moment. Please, please listen. Stop and think about what I'm saying. It is God's great concern that we be comforted. We're talking about the God of all creation. He wants us to be comforted. And yet, Christians walk around with their heads down. They don't have that comfort. They don't know that peace and that joy. It's what God wants for them. Why don't they have it? Because they're going about it through law, not grace. God exhorts us over and over and over again to comfort. You know, what we do is we try to whip one another into shape. You know, you're not serving enough. You're not saving enough. You're not studying enough. You're not witnessing enough. You're not giving enough. And on and on it goes. If you just do this or that or the other thing, I mean, folks, imagine what we could do for the Lord. If, I mean, all of us, if, just try to imagine for a moment every Christian full of joy, peace, comfort. Well, I suppose that, you know, there wouldn't be much place for ministry then. Maybe that's why it's that way. I don't know. All I know is, is that, that it, well, my sister believed, she, she believes that the only source of knowledge is one's personal experience. That's, my sister believes that. But I praise God that that's not true. I mean, my personal experiences have been pretty, <laughs> pretty topsy-turvy. Christ is the source of wisdom and knowledge. We're also taught that God rejoices over us. Did you know that God rejoices over you? He rejoices over you. God isn't punishing you. He's not, God's not up in heaven sticking pins in your doll. He's not trying to make life rough for you. You know, for all the sin, He's not punishing you for, for all the sin and the stupidity, all the ignorance, indifference on your part. What is proclaimed in the, in the person of Christ is comfort and glad rejoicing over you. Even though I am absent, yet am I with you in the Spirit, joying and rejoicing over your steadfastness in the faith. Why? 
because you've been reconciled through the perfect finished work of Christ. And God has given us a walk. He's given us each a walk. He gave me my walk. He gave you your walk. You didn't design your walk. As you therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in Him. You received Him as a gift. You received the walk as a gift. If, if Christians today could just come to grips with the fact that our walk, their walk, is a gift from Almighty God. One that ought to be prized. Prized. Oh, but it's not like, you know, this guy's walk. It's not like so-and-so's walk. You know, I'm not, a, I'm not as good as this guy. I'm not as rich as they are. I'm not as smart as they are. I'm not as healthy as they are. Why don't you praise God for where you are and what you are? Your walk is a gift from God. Our walk is a gift, and it is a walk by faith. And the problem is when we preach about being a walk by faith, well, it's always slanted toward your faith, which may, may sometimes fail. And I'm 100% convinced. No, I'm 200% convinced that the Word of God says that our walk is by His faith. It's the faithfulness of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's, that's the very foundation the solid foundation of my walk. He's faithful. He can be trusted. He never lies. That walk is not only based on His faithfulness, but it's based on His work, His work, not on ours. It's, it's, a, it's a walk with thanksgiving, abounding therein with thanksgiving. And once again, I refresh your memory that proper thanksgiving can't be understood until we view God in the proper light the sovereign monarch of the ages and of your life. We are, we are complete in Him. That's what we were taught. If you are complete in Him, then what more is needed? What more would, could you want? Uh, baptism, circumcision, church membership, laying on of hands. We can go on down that list too. No, you're complete in Him. If you are complete in Him, well, there can be no purgatory. There can be no judgment. In fact, the gospel rings out and its sound is crystal clear. There is no judgment for you who are in Christ Jesus. Why is that? Why is it that most Christians that I talk to fear some impending judgment when God says, I have nothing against you. There is no judgment for those who are in Christ. Well, I believe you'll give an account for the use of your talents as you use them for Christ. But God isn't going to show some rerun of your, all of your sin, all that garbage, on some giant TV screen. Okay, what a, what a horrible thought to even, you know, thing to even think about. You are complete in Him. You are complete in Him, not by your walk, but first of all, because the body of sin of the flesh has been cut off by Christ's circumcision. Not by yours. Second, because you have been completely identified with Him buried with Him in baptism, wherein also you rose with Him through the faith of the operation of God who has raised Him from the dead. You saw the same thing in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1. He raised Christ from the dead by the greatness of His power, and you who were dead in trespasses and sin, when God raised Christ, He raised you. You raised when He raised. I mean, I mean, how intimate and how complete is that, that identification? You are complete with respect to the forgiveness of sin, having forgiven you all trespasses. 
you are complete with respect to the law, blotting out the, the, the handwriting of ordinances that was against us. And where were, were they placed? Fastened securely to his cross. You can't unnail them, okay? They are securely fastened to his cross. You can't unfasten them. The nails I use, uh, you know, I mean, I can pull them out. Well, sometimes I, I can't. But you can't ever unfasten those ordinances, folks. We are dead to the law that we might bear fruit unto God. You are complete with respect to principalities and powers. That includes Satan. He can't touch you. He never will. The evil one cannot touch us. We know that whosoever is born of God sinneth not, but he that's begotten of God keepeth himself, and that wicked one toucheth him not. 1 John 5, 18. Anybody tells you, if anybody, folks, tells you that he can, they're lying to you. You are absolutely safe in Christ. How are we to admonish? Lest any man should beguile you. That's paralegizomai. That's use parallel logic. You know, that it sounds right, but it's not. Parallel logic that would take you away from the truth of Christ. You know, kind of like, well, oh, the Lord Jesus Christ, you know, He began this marvelous work. Now it's up to you to finish it. You believe that, folks, and you've allowed yourself to be deceived. Many of those things that, that they'll say to you, they, they'll sound good. You know, I, I can't deny that at all. You have to give. You have to serve. You have to pray. You have to attend. Read your Bible. Study more. Witness to others. you got to join a church. you got to be baptized. The list goes on and on and on and on and on. We don't make demands of one another, folks, and call it comforting one another. Don't be led away by parallel logic. Don't be beguiled. Be on your guard. Chapter 2.8 Beware lest any man rob you. Don't let anybody use parallel logic to, to take you away from the truth of the Word of God. Be on your guard so that you're not cheated, robbed, by a love of wisdom, philosophy, human wisdom. Don't let anybody rob you from the truth by human, a human love of wisdom. Man's tradition, the teachings of men, of a world religious system based on human merit. Don't let any man judge you. Verse 16, let no man therefore judge you in meat and drink and so forth. Don't let them put you under condemnation. You know, like, well, all good Christians come to church wearing a white shirt and a tie, uh, not a blue jean, not a blue shirt and a t-shirt, Steve. And you know, and all you people with bow ties, you know, you know that's 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 totally unacceptable. It it sometimes it'll border on the ridiculous. Don't let anybody do those things. I'm not, I'm not saying you shouldn't dress proper, folks. Of course you should. But don't let anybody put you under condemnation. That, that you are condemned because, before God because of something, you know, that you've done or not done. or Because God has nothing against us. God has nothing against you, folks. If you are a believer in Jesus Christ... I got some great news for you. God ain't got anything against you. Nothing. God doesn't work in shadows, okay? All that, all that law is a shadow of things to come. But the truth is Christ. The law came through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. Christ is the fulfillment of the law. And I am horrified that you'd put me under law when God hasn't. Well, I just, I'm just, I won't let you. Okay.
Don't let any man rule you unsafe, umpire you. You are safe in Christ. You're complete in Him, holy, unblameable, unreprovable in His sight. Don't let any man rule against you in self-willed worship. Christ is the head of the body. He's not only the head, He's the provider. Christ provides. Man doesn't. Don't live by the law. If you're dead with Christ, why as though deriving your life from the world system do you subject yourself to ordinances, touch not, taste not, handle not, you know, actually allow yourselves to be subjected to, to ordinances. That is a warning from God, folks. Do you, do, you, do you care about God's warnings? That's a warning to you. It's not an exhortation to live by law. It's a warning. Don't live by law. Live by grace. So, if law doesn't work, what does? We were shown. Set your affection on things above. If you've been risen with Christ, and you are, first class condition, since you've been risen with Christ, set your affection on things above. Set your affection on things above. Because there's the finished work of Christ. And He is seated, exercising His position as deity, at the right hand of God. He's seated. His work is finished. That's where your mind and your affection, your attention ought to be. Take a stand, folks. Live this day as who you are. There's a, there's a fantastic difference between trying to live in order, in a way that you might be something and living like what you already are. You're a children of the king. You are a child of the king. Live like it. You're holy. Live like it. You're forgiven. Live like it. God doesn't have anything against you. Live like it. You, you've been blessed with every spiritual blessing in the heavenlies in Christ. Folks, live like it. You're not under law but grace. You've been accepted in the beloved. Secure in Christ. Live like it. Live like who you are. You're a saint. You're righteous. You've been made the righteousness of God in Christ. Live like it. The problem with Christians today in the, in the main is that they don't know how to live. When God has plainly told them how to live by telling them who they are. Folks, don't suffer from an identity crisis of all things. If you are a Christian, at least, at the very least, come to know who you are in Christ. That's my burden for you, for you folks, because I love you dearly. I know absolutely that God will never disown you. You're God's child. And the exhortation is to live like who you are. Don't live, don't live it in order to become it, but live it because you are it. You have put off the old man, you've put on the new man. Now live like it. Whatever you do, no matter what it is, not only do it with thanksgiving, but do it because you're serving the Lord. Why? Why do you do what you do? Because you love the Lord. Not because you love your husband, not not that you shouldn't love your husband. I kind of like being loved. I mean, that's absolutely beside the point. You're doing, you're doing what you're doing because you love the Lord. Husbands, you do what you do because you love the Lord. It's secondary that you love your wife. It's primary that you love the Lord. And you wives, if, if your husband's loving the Lord more than he's loving you, you don't have a thing to worry about. And that goes vice, ver vice versa. Children, obey. The Word is here. Listen to your parents because they love the Lord. You do that because you love the Lord. They're doing it as unto the Lord. Fathers, treat your children as the Lord treats you. Your, 
you're raising your children as to the Lord. Not because of, of for any other reason, not to, to take pride, you know, on your own selfish sort of pride in their accomplishments. Now, I don't know there's a fine line there, but maybe you understand what I'm saying. You treat your kids as the Lord treats you. You're raising your kids as to the Lord. Not because of any law or tradition. And servants, chapter 3, verse 22. You're not serving a human master. You're serving Christ. You don't do shoddy work. Why? Because, you know, well, because you can get away with it. No, you don't do... You don't do shoddy work because you're it's you're doing it as unto the Lord. I don't care what kind of cruddy job it is. You are not serving a boss. You're serving Christ, though nobody may, may see it. Nobody ever no nobody knows what you did. And we come to the twenty fifth verse, the twenty fifth verse, and that seems to be a big problem with a lot of people, with almost everyone who studies this passage even me, but he that doeth wrong shall receive for the wrong which he's done, and there's no respect of persons. And so now, well, we got to decide if this is saying that we face the prospect of, of either heaven or hell, depending on how we live, because we've taken the verse out of context. So in the final analysis, you know, we may wind up in hell, which I don't think that's what the text is saying. I don't think that's a fair treatment of the text. Since I know that I'm going to receive the reward of the inheritance, verse 24, hello, how could I possibly make verse 25 say, I may not receive the reward, the, the inheritance? That's sloppy exegesis, folks. That kind of spiritual vacillation, that yo-yo technique, you know, I see it I, all the time. I see it used over and over and over again in modern preaching. You know, on, on one side, I have you basking in the reality of glory and your inheritance, and then, you know, a moment later, I'm dipping your feet into the, into the lake of fire. I mean, I, folks, we can't make one verse contradict what the previous verse just said. He that does wrong shall bear. The word is not received. The word in the Greek is bear. Carry away the wrong that he's done. This is what the Greek text says. It applies to the master as well as to the servant. We're looking at servants. We may carry with us or bear what we did wrong. That's what the text is saying. There's a reputation that attaches itself to every one of you, and I think that's what the text is saying. I don't, I don't believe that we can take the text and make it say that, you know, we're going to carry into heaven the wrong that we've done. God is saying that He won't be embittered against us, that He loves us with an eternal, enduring love. I believe also that God is saying that there's no respect of persons, and He placed on Christ the wrong that I've done, so the exhortation in verse 25 it really is, is, is two-pronged. It's back to the servant of verse 22, and it's ahead to the master of chapter 4, verse 1. And both, of, of the, both are counseled to carefully consider what he does because he serves Christ. The servant is serving Christ. The master realizes that he has a master in heaven. Masters, give unto your servants that which is the just and equal, knowing that you also have a master in heaven. I can realize what has been given to me is the righteousness of Christ, that my citizenship is in heaven, that I'm serving the Lord, and that I've been given, I've been made the righteousness of, of God in Christ, and folks, if that doesn't influence the way that I work and the way that I live, then I don't know what will. I know, I know law won't. What marvelous confidence, peace, rest must come 
to the troubled mind that realizes that he belongs to Christ, that, that God's love is never ending. You know, we've made this few years that we have, this pitiful few years that we have here on, on this earth so desperately important to us that, you know, eternity and fellowship with God seems to be so far off. And I think in, in many minds, almost unreal. I believe as surely as I live and breathe will stand before God Almighty clothed in the righteousness of Christ. God is God. I'm His child. What I do here, if I do it knowing that I'm serving Christ, it doesn't matter what He does with me. Whether I'm rich, poor, healthy, sick, doesn't matter if I'm happy or sad. I'm commanded to give unto those who are un under me that which is just and equal because that's what my Master in Heaven has done to me. That's what He's given me. When I think of what God's done for me in the person of Christ, it's, it's an easy thing for, for me to walk that way here. My going to heaven is not based upon how I've lived, but upon the righteousness, the honor, the integrity, the truthfulness of God, His reputation, folks. Chapter 4, verse 2. It's a present active imperative. Continue in prayer and watch. In the same with thanksgiving. we got a similar construction in 1 Thessalonians. Pray without ceasing. I don't believe that means continue in asking like, you know, I want to, you know, I want a new pickup and I want a new horse. I want a pretty new horse and I want a, a new saddle and I want to. I don't think that's what that means at all. I think that's Christians tend to look at it that way, but that's that's not what I see there. I think the verse is saying that we should continue in an attitude of worship. And I find that very difficult. That's that's why I preferred well, I, I mean, look, it's I'm not in any way suggesting that we shouldn't be diligent in 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 doing go, going about doing what the God what God is has placed it before us, you know. He's he's laid out our walk. Whatever that might be, you know, whatever job that is, relationship. But I'm persuaded that that can be carried on in an attitude of worship. I find it I find it very difficult sometimes to continue in that in a in an attitude of worship. I, I know I, I believe we all do. You know, it's easy when everything's going right. You know, without even looking, I can reach over there and there's that pair of wire cutters. You know, but most of the time when I want it, it's not there. It's not there. You know, you'd think it, I'd, I'd probably got more tools scattered around everywhere You'd think that I'd always find what I need, but usually I don't. Most of the time when I want it, it's not there. It's not, it's not on the tool board. It isn't in my toolbox. It's the only tool missing. You know, I dump out my toolbox, and the only tool that isn't there is the one that I need. And it's amazing to me how that in final desperation I say, Okay, okay, Lord, okay. I, and man, it's then it's right there. It's all, I, almost as if He created it, you, you know? It's almost as if He made it. I find it easy to grumble and complain. I think we're told to persist in worship in praise of God, and keep awake in the same with thanksgiving. I believe that's what the text is saying. I'm certain that, a, that an attitude of thanksgiving, you know, has to, I mean, unless it's a fake attitude, 
it must include with it the sovereignty of God, the majesty of His person, and His purpose in my life, the realization that He's working in me, in me both the will and do of His good pleasure. He knows where those wire cutters are. I, folks, I, I'm, I'm being serious. God is sovereign. He knows where those wire cutters are. He's placed me in a situation to where He's allowed me not, He's willed that I not find those wire cutters. Okay? And then, and then He's like, well, I'll, I'll, all right, let's see what Steve's going to do here. Well, not that he doesn't already know what I'm going to do, but maybe you get the point. The entire aspect of Thanksgiving, and the reason I'm focusing on this is because it's mentioned so much in this epistle. Verse 3. Praying also for us that God would open unto us a door of utterance to speak the mystery of Christ for which I am also in bonds. Bonds. That I may make it manifest as I ought to speak. Now, whatever that, that door of the word means, the translators, they've obviously they, they've concluded in the authorized version that it, that it means an opportunity to speak the word that God would open a door unto us, an opportunity to speak the word. I think the popular uh, idea is that Paul's in prison, and what he's asking there is that, is that he be allowed out of prison so he might preach. And uh, well, I, I don't I don't happen to think that that's right. I don't think the Holy Spirit is having Paul write that he wants to be freed from prison so he can go on preaching that God would open unto us a door of utterance to speak the mystery of Christ for which I am also in bonds. That's, that's a perfect passive. I've been completely bound in past time with the consummate result that I'm now permanently bound. In order that, in order that, I may make it manifest as I ought to speak. Now the bonds there, folks, they can be they can be his prison chains, it can be his chains, it can be his cell, his prison cell. I freely admit that. I don't believe that that's what the verse is saying, but that's what most people think it says. And and most people may very well be right. I believe Paul is saying Woe is me if I preach not the gospel, for necessity is laid on me. I believe that the bonds here is not the chains that he wore, or, or the prison cell, or the prison that he was in, the dungeon that he was in. God has taken him and placed him under obligation to speak the word In order that I may make it clear or manifest as I ought to speak, and the word translate ought there, well, for you Greek students, that's, an, that's the interesting day word, you know, delta, epsilon, iota. And I think people have a lot of problems with this word. I know I have. There are two Greek words which are translated must or ought, and one of them is, is the word of obligation, and the other is the word of necessity. It's the same word in John 3. Marvel not, but I say unto you, you must be born again. It's not the must of obligation there in John 3. It's the must of necessity. There's where, there's where a lot of Christians are become confused. They'll say, you must be born again. See, that's an obligation on your part. You must be born again. That's not what the text is saying. It's the must of necessity. Jesus was simply saying, it, it is necessary you be born again. It's just that simple. You will be born again if you're God's child. 
So what do we do with the word ought here in, in the text? If we're going to be consistent in our use of the language, is this the must of necessity or the must of obligation? Is the Holy Spirit saying that Paul has an obligation to speak the word? Uh, the normal approach, you know, to the verse is that Paul has an obligation and he's greatly concerned that he fulfills that obligation. That may well, very well be what the text is saying, folks. I, I believe the Holy Spirit is saying that only he could provide those opportunities whereby we who are chained to the gospel can speak. And it is, it's, I, I don't know, maybe it's both, obligation and necessity. I, you, you, I'm going to leave it to you folks to decide. Uh, I'm going to suggest it's, we can't teach anything other than that. So it almost seems as if both are true. And so, is the mystery of Christ, is that if you accept Him, you'll go to heaven? If you reject Him, you'll go to hell? Is that the subject of, of that verse? Is the mystery of Christ, folks, is when we use that phrase, mystery of Christ, is that telling you how to live with your wife, how to live with your husband, how to raise your kids, how to get along with your boss, how to pay your bills, how to, how to manage your life? Is, is that telling you how to live a, a victorious Christian life? I don't believe the mystery of Christ is the subject of most preaching that I hear today. I'm going to suggest that the great concern of the Holy Spirit here is that Christ be proclaimed. I believe we proclaim the mystery of Christ, the secret of Christ, the revelation of Christ, the life of Christ, the message of Christ, a, a mystery in the sense of something, not something unknown, but what God has revealed in the person and the work of His Son. The, the verse fits exactly with the 28th verse of chapter 1. Whom we preach, warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom that we may present every man perfect, complete in Christ. And I believe, folks, that our worship is that God would open hearts because we don't know who they are. It's for that reason that I have been bound by the Lord Jesus Christ. It's not that, you know, for that reason I've been put in prison, but for, but for that reason God has captured me. Oh, that I may apprehend that for which I also I've been apprehended by Christ, said Paul. There's the bond. Perhaps in order that I may make it clear what the mystery of Christ is as it is necessary to be spoken or as only I can speak. I, I don't have any other message. Verse 5, walk in wisdom toward them that are without, redeeming the time. Verse 6, let your speech be always with grace seasoned with salt that you may know how you ought to answer every man. You know, wisdom, folks, doesn't have time for foolish, senseless debate. We're to avoid that. I don't have the verses right offhand, but many of you are familiar with those. Avoid that sort of discussion. Mostly that pertains to law. In order that... Uh, that you may know how you ought to answer every man. Salt, we know salt preserves our speech from being corrupt. Uh, seasoned, salt is a seasoning. Seasoned, so that our speech, our communication, so it's seasoned, it's, it's palatable. It's not tasteless to those who, who hear us. You know, and we all know how our mouth can get us in trouble sometimes. Well-seasoned speech. We saw that in Ephesians chapter 4 and 5 both. You know, we're, it's contrasted with what we're looking at with the seasoned speech here. Is, it's contrasted in Ephesians 
with the filthy communication, corrupt communication. 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 2, my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power. So it's easy for me to see why the Holy Spirit would say, you know, this here. And the epistle will close with God knowing us by name. Just look at all the names, folks. It'd take us a month or two or three to go through all these names. God knows us by name. And the marvelous truth that He doesn't have anything against us. Grace. The epistle ends with grace. God has nothing against us. You know, in the Old Testament, we can see, you know, things against, you know, God had things against Lot, Samson, Samuel, Solomon, David. Well, I could rattle on names for the half an hour. In the New Testament, we can see, well, in the New Testament, God sees us as new creations in Christ. When God looks at you, He doesn't even know that you sin. Amazing. Do you realize that 90% or, percent or more of Christianity is primarily focused on sin? when if they are God's child, God doesn't even see the sin? Please wrap your mind around that. Please take a moment to pause this, the video if necessary and try to wrap your mind around that fact because it's a fact, it's true. It's true. And so, your sins are removed as far as the east is from the west, cast behind his back, buried in the deepest sea, sought for and not found, remembered no more. One of the great marvels of grace is the God who knows all things, yet remembers your sins no more. These are marvelous truths, folks. And if your hope, if your, if your trust, if your joy is centered in, in the person and the work, of Jesus Christ, then folks, you have but, but a tiny taste of the rapture to come. I love you all. I truly do. Until next time, this is Steve. Thanks for watching. Hey, Scotty, what are you doing, buddy? Come on.